Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much for being here once again for Tea Time. Today we have a little bit of focus and misty morning and that is it, nice and clean. So good guys. I hope you're enjoying your cup of tea or maybe a cup of me. Today is going to be something different. Today we are live. That doesn't happen all the time but I absolutely love lives because we can interact with you and any kind of questions that you have, we can answer them out of the chat window in comparison to always in the comments, right? So before I get into it, I want to say that if you are here, you're new, you haven't subscribed to the channel, subscribe. By the end of this video, if you like it, please throw it a thumbs up. That will be helpful also. So today we're going to have a really great guy he is part of our community, and this is, I guess you would call, a member spotlight. Today we have John Drummond with us. He is a landscape photographer. So let me get him online here. Can you hear me, John? I hear you fine. How are you doing, my friend? Welcome. Welcome to the channel. Thank you for being here. Well, thanks for having me. This is, this is awesome. Awesome. So... I just want to real quick have you just give me the or everyone the little 30 second elevator pitch of who you are so we know before we even get into this conversation. Okay, sure. Well, uh, I'm an amateur photographer. I'm retired from uh, 40 years of uh, federal government service. I've uh, been an artist of one kind or another uh, most of my life. I've been a painter at one point. I actually you know, got a degree in art from uh, Queens College. I live in New York City in Queens County and I've uh, lived here all my life pretty much. You know, and now in retirement, I'm able to de uh, dedicate more time to photography and really into landscape photography, which is a specific genre I've really just gotten into in the last uh, few years. And I'm still working on it. Nice. Nice. Landscape photography. I know um, it's not something that I do a lot. I do a lot of commercial work, but I love to be able to relax and do landscape when I get an opportunity because it's you just kind of can relax be nice and in this peaceful kind of serene um, atmosphere, you know, is in commercial work, it's, you know, you have a lot of people that are pulling and pushing and they want this and they want that. It's very hectic. And most of the time we're um, at a time constraint with everything. I do a lot of, let's call them famous people. And sometimes we'll end up with like a minute, two minutes, very, very short periods of time, 10 minutes with someone and that's it. So mm -hmm. you either get the shot or you don't. So when you're dealing with nature or landscape or birding or anything that you're just out there in the wildlife and just relaxing and just hearing the wind, I think that's awesome. That is awesome. And seeing no, that you, you know, seeing that you went to art school but didn't do any of your art for thirty plus years and now finally are being able to do it, I think that's awesome. I, I love that. That's inspiring. That you still have that passion to go and do the art now be creative in comparison to before where you had, like you said, that the job, the federal job, let's call it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I did, I never, I mean, I always had the, the, the feeling or the soul of, of being an artist, even if I wasn't doing it professionally. I mean, I had a family, I got married relatively young. I had four kids. They're all grown now, uh, two grandchildren now. So that's all, that's a lot of fun, but I never really gave up, you know, altogether in terms of being an artist. And it, I, I hadn't, I had stopped painting quite a while ago, but I've had a photographer, a camera of one kind or another pretty much, you know, since childhood and really got into uh, the right. digital photography in the last, over the last decade or so, you know, once I really needed to, what felt I needed to up my game in terms of the quality of my work and what types of stuff I was shooting. So. Right. You have an art major from Queens, right? From Queens uh, College. Queens yeah. That's, College. that's that part that's, of the, right. That's part of the city university. Yeah. I ended up going Right. I ended up going to the Art Institute way back in the day and getting a degree there along with multiple other degrees. Um, but uh, I didn't use it for quite some time. For about 13 years, I ran a software company. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know that. But, uh, you know, as a system administrator, I knew software inside and out. I know Unix, Linux, whatever you want to uh, call it. 
Um, and then finally I said, you know, I, I can't do this anymore. I need to do the art that I was programmed to do at birth, you know? <laughs> so right. that's exactly. basically what, you know, that was kind of what happened with me. And then, you know, everything right. kind of uh, snowballed from there. I know a lot of the work that you did, just, just so that you know, um, I went to your YouTube channel and I watched some of your videos and I was like, wow, you know, these are some really, really good videos. And what I really enjoyed about them is that, you know, you were able to explain what you were doing. And if you weren't doing it just right, you said, you know, look, I don't understand a hundred percent of what I'm doing, but we're going to get through it kind of together. And the final output of a lot of those shoots were just absolutely awe-inspiring, just beautiful, beautiful pictures. And when you made mistakes, you said, look, this was a mistake, but that's okay. We're just going to keep going. And, uh, you know, I really appreciated that. And I think that a lot of the folks that are watching uh, me, a lot of them are not pros. They are amateurs or pro-ams. And I think definitely they should go and take a look at your channel when we're all done with this um, kind of hangout, this uh, member spotlight and see some of your work. Now, what I'm going to do is while we're talking, I'll probably do it right now. I want to throw on some of your work. I'm going to bring up your website first because um, that's where I went to go and learn a little bit more about you. And it's beautiful. There is a lot of um, great photos in here. You have your portfolio that we can take a look at. But what I'm going to do is while we're talking, I'll bring up some of the images here as well as on Flickr and on Instagram and whatnot. So if there's anything that you want to talk about on there, just definitely let me know and we'll kind of stop and review, so to speak. I love this picture. Look at that. That is absolutely beautiful. Wow. Beautiful. Yeah, let me go ahead. I'm going to I'm going to go through this a couple of them just to just so you can see. Look at that. That's beautiful. Look at the colors. Oh, okay. Nice. <laughs> of course. Wow. <laughs> wow, look at that. That's gorgeous, too. Oh, I see that. That's right, Monroe. I think it's on there at the bottom. That's beautiful, beautiful. Then they've got Dawn. That's beautiful. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, there's so many. I'm going to be, I'm just going to put these in the background and we can kind of discuss them um, kind of uh, as we go. But what I wanted to ask you is, I, I know that... But someone's you, someone's on the chat saying my audio is missing. Oh, your audio is out? Yeah. Um, I can hear you right now. Let me see. Um, uh, you hear me. I hear me. Maybe when we went to the screen, was your audio gone? Let me see. Let me go and Let do it again. Let's see. Mm, that could be what it is. Well, that's what it looks like. Right. It is. It was falling. Your it was taking your audio out while uh, uh, while we oh. were on the full screen. That's Don Edwards says there. now it's working. Yeah. That's all right. So what now I'll do working. is I'll leave it like this instead of going back there. And then maybe we'll throw in some pictures here and there as we go. Um, but anyways, I wanted to get uh, from you this whole journey that you're on now, you know, talk about it just a little bit, because I know you were saying that, you know, now that you're retired, you wanted to get really out there and be able to shoot a lot of pictures. And right. uh, we had your audio was off there while we we're looking at some of those pictures. So yeah, just talk about them just a little bit. Um, the ones that we just saw, and from where you were when you captured them. Okay, well, first of all, in terms of just you know, lands, uh, landscape photography generally, I really only got into that recently in the last maybe four years or so. Um, you know, before that, I was shooting like 
you know, bird, I was doing a lot of bird photography. If you see on my website, I've got a whole bird page and flower uh, page because I like to do macros and, and that kind of thing. But the landscape was kind of a something I, I really got interested after watching um, some people on YouTube, actually. Thomas Heaton particularly was maybe the first landscape photographer I really followed on YouTube and actually had a chance to see him at a live seminar a few years ago. And uh, so he's one, and that's really what kind of got my attention in terms of landscape photography. And when I retired, I, I was looking forward to the opportunity of uh, traveling regularly, which I did the first, you know, like in 2018, I had a few photo trips in 2019. And then of course, last year happened. So, <laughs> so which has yeah. maybe been a kind of a blessing in disguise. <laughs> it's been right, a blessing no, in disguise because now I'm, uh, you had some... so now I'm trying, now, so now I'm trying to, uh, I've been doing actually, you know, obviously out of, out of necessity, doing a lot of local photography. And actually I'm finding places that I really had kind of overlooked before or hadn't really shot that much before. And I'm also doing a lot of woodland photography because here in the, uh, you know, in the lower New York area, it's not, we don't have a lot of uh, dramatic landscape or seascape and stuff, but I, we do have a lot of woods and a lot of woodland parks. And so I'm able to focus more gotcha. on, on, on small scenes and small like vignettes of, 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 of nature. And uh, that's really that's I find right. actually that pretty interesting also in terms of just a general, you know, part of or genre within landscape photography. Yeah, one of the questions that came in from Leo, he's uh, from Germany. He says, uh, "What are your most used ND filters?" That's a great question because, as you can see in some of those photos right. that I brought up, you can really see that mistiness of the water where you have an extremely long shutter. Um, to get that yeah. beautiful, almost etheric look to it. It's absolutely yeah, that's, gorgeous. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the, the one uh, sunrise shot that you saw there um, that I took in Maine, I used a 10-stop filter for that, and it was probably about a, about a maybe a four-minute exposure, something close to that. Wow. Um, that's probably the, maybe the longest that I've done. You know, um, But in terms of most used, it depends on the situation, obviously, because of the matter of, of uh, what, shutter what, is, what shutter speed I want. And uh, what uh, and what um, what the lighting is, so right. Exactly. I'd say I probably How use the six stop most. Yeah, I'd say I use the six stop most. And do you use the six stop would be the most? Gotcha. And yeah. do you use like yeah. I know some landscape photographers they'll use their iPhone and they'll have like an app and they'll be able to program mm -hmm. in exactly what the yeah. time, what the ND is, what this, and then yeah. it'll come back with at least a an idea of what to shoot. Do you do something like that also? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I have uh, have photo pills, and that's one of the functions I use photo pills for. But I also um, have a, I have a very similar app from Lee, uh, Lee Filters. They have their own app. So basically, it's worth what you do. You take um, your base exposure without the filter and then use the, uh, the, uh, the app to figure out what, filter or maybe even changing the other exposure settings you want to get the shutter speed that you want. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So that, that makes, that makes it a lot easier. Um, sure. I know we had a great guy on here that was doing astrophotography and a lot of times you're using different programs to be able to find out where things are going to be, um, where the sun will be and this type of thing. It'll get, mm -hmm. it allows you to get an idea of what you're trying to create before you even create it, which is, which is exactly. absolutely awesome. Um, I know that for, you know, Many folks out there, they will immediately say, well, what camera did you use or what lens did you use? And a lot of mm -hmm. times that's not important. But today, now that a lot of folks are moving towards mirrorless, um, I guess I should ask you, what camera are you using majority when you're out there? Are you using, I know you're a Canon shooter. I know you have like an R6, right. you have like a 5D Mark IV, you have other cameras. What cameras do you normally use when you're out there capturing your landscape work? All right. Well, I've been doing my the bulk of my photography for um, for the last several years has been a 5D Mark IV. As he's mentioned, I am a Canon user. Actually, going back to my film days, like in the 80s, I had an A1. Actually, I had two A1s. Neither one of them works now, but I still have them just for the heck. Right. Um, but yeah, I use a 5D Mark IV. Um, that was one of actually that which actually was my retirement present to myself because before that, I was using a 7D Mark II, but I decided I didn't want to go full frame because I bought a lens that really. Um, you know, it was a wide angle lens of 16 to 35 and it, I realized it wasn't wide enough for what I wanted to do with it and I needed to go to a full frame. So that's the reason I went to the 5D Mark IV to get full frame and be able to make more advantage of, uh, of wide angle lenses. 
you know, and that goes actually to the, to the point of why right. one yeah, upgrades in the first place or why one changes kit. And for me, I can't speak for everybody, you know, but for me, I do it when the, when I come across a photographic challenge that, you know, regularly enough that my current gear can't answer, you know, so that's pretty much it. That's, yeah, right. that's why I went to full frame. That's why I bought certain lenses because once I got good enough in either photography or, or within my editing, that I realized that maybe this lens has too much chromatic aberration. This lens isn't as sharp as I want it to be for the kind of stuff that I'm doing. That's when I start looking around. But I don't, I'm not I'm not right. a kit chaser, so to speak. Can't afford it for one thing. Yeah, that that that's a hundred. Yeah, I know, I know. There was so there was a time when DSLR started coming, let's say, um, up, let's say, and people were moving away from film. And what happened was is the camera manufacturers started producing at like a breakneck speed um, cameras. And I remember right. when the Canon, what was it, the uh, 10D came out. We went from like 10D to 20D to 30D to 40D to, it was just like continue, literally every six months there was like another one, right. another one, and another right. one. With little small iterative changes, nothing big. Then the 5D came out, which was that full frame, and then a 5D Mark II, mm -hmm. which was a major change. What I noticed lately with the whole uh, mirrorless thing is we're getting to that point again where we're seeing the camera manufacturers, instead of going from like a year or two year time frame, they're now all of a sudden going to this, right. once again, like I said, breakneck speed where they're putting out cameras every four months, six months, eight months, nine months, a year maximum. And I don't even see a year. Some of this stuff is literally every six months we're seeing new mirrorless cameras. So I think we're gonna get to that point again. But mm -hmm. what we also notice is the prices are not cheap on these mirrorless cameras. They ripped no. out a mirror, they threw an EVF in and they're charging a lot more. So like you said, we don't have money to go blow. Do you really need the latest and greatest or can you capture some really amazing photos with what you have and chances are with what you have is probably good enough right no yeah i totally agree i mean the whole idea like i said i was building my skills and as as my skills eventually either caught up to or slightly past the photography that the, the the gear that i was using that's when i pretty much upgraded i mean i bought us my actually my first D, uh, uh dslr or yeah my first dslr was a 60d and um, I bought that in 2012 because well, before that I was using a point and shoot, not a point and shoot. It was a, it was like one of these all in ones. It was actually a Canon right. power shot, something or other. Mm -hmm. And I had, I had uh, gone to a, uh, to, to Vegas actually you know, one year and took a trip. Actually this, uh, the first time I went to the Grand Canyon and I took some photos that I thought were pretty good until I, you know, got home and edited them. And I said, well, you know, this is not as sharp as I nearly as I want to be. I said, I need to get better kit. You know, because the composition is good, the lighting is right. good, but the image justice are there. And that's when I went to the 60D and two kit lenses. And when that was fine with me for a while until I started doing yeah, bird that's... photography. And then then the 60D wasn't didn't have enough burst rate and it wasn't compatible with the 400 millimeter lens that I just bought. So I well, got the 70, 7D Mark II to, to uh, you know, for bird photography. So like I said, you know, from as, yeah, as problems that... arose now that my current kit couldn't answer, that's kind of when I went to look to, to upgrade. That is the, and that's the perp, that's perfect. And everyone should take something out of that because you don't upgrade until the kit that you have can't do what you need it to do. That's the bottom line. Right. There's nothing really, right. there's no, there's no secret to it. But the problem is, is people don't believe that or understand that. Right. It's smarter to go with a better lens than go with a new body. It's smarter to exactly. go with more education than go with a new body. So many people think right. that the, you know, the gear makes the photographer, and that's just not it. The photographer makes the no, gear, totally. period. But like you said, if you cannot get to the place where you need to be or where you envision yourself being when it comes to the quality of the image, well, at that time, well, maybe it's time to upgrade. Also, if your kit does not allow you to do something that you need it to do. For example, when we went into video, so now we have hybrid cameras. Well, if a camera right. only does photo, but you wanna also capture some 10 second clips, well, now you might need to upgrade to a hybrid type style camera like every right. one of them are as of today. And, and we also have- And that uh, is exactly uh, why I had the R6. <laughs> and right, and I, there you I, go. Because I developed right. an interest in video and that's, that's it, right, in which I started only last July and started with a GoPro. Right. You know, but I, I say, you know, I really need to do something a little bit better because I want to, you know, if I'm going to do something, I want to do it as 
well as I can. And uh, obviously, right. the, uh, by that time, the, the R5 and the R6 were all in the news already before they even came out. And R5 was out of my budget, so I bought the R6 because everything about it looked pretty good. And so far, I'm very happy with that. But that's exactly what I got because, mm -hmm. because it, it, it could do better video than anything else that I, that I had. Right. As it turns out, right, it's really right, good. Right. It Susan too. has a question here. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Susan has a question here. She says, can yeah, I you recommend it. apps? So um, now I'm guessing that she's saying apps on the phone um, for, for doing what you're doing. If that's not it, Susan, definitely write that, write something else well, into the chat. But I'm going to guess, now you said it was what, PhotoPill is what, what you're using? Well, currently? I use PhotoPills, but yeah, I use PhotoPills, but I also have a Lee. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of apps, a million apps that can do um, um, exposure uh, calculations, but uh, the photo pills because it does a lot of other things too. You know, it's one I would certainly recommend. Does it? Yeah, I, I saw you, Susan. Um, let me ask you one thing: Does that photo pills? Does it sure. allow you to also track the sun so that you know, like, if you're doing a landscape yes. shot and you want the sun to be in a specific location? All right, it does that. So that's okay. Really it, yeah, it has. A, There's been it has a function. Yeah, it doesn't have because it has a fun. Well, you know what actually really is even better than that is the uh, the photographers of Paramus. Uh, you know, if you know that app, that's gotcha. a, that so one's that's really one. good for for being able to. Yeah, that's another really good one for uh, planning. Not so much, yeah, not so much tracking, but basically planning your photography or based around where the sun or the moon are going to be around um, at uh, relative to a particular spot that you that you plan to go to. So if you like to plan pre plan your 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 shoots uh, a lot. Um, that app is, 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 I found very uh, useful for knowing kind of where the sun's going to pop up on a certain day and then be able to see what, what item of interest in, within the scene is going to line up with the sun in the way that I want it so I can get there in, you know, you know, in advance. That's an example of what you can do with that app. You know, checks the yeah, phases of the moon and like, all kinds of stuff that like that. Like, yeah. Right. Right. That's really great. That is good. Because yeah. whenever you're doing landscape, I know there was a couple of people that I've talked to in the past that do some landscape photography, um, but let's call it in an ironscape, you know, like where you were in uh, uh, New York, and they always wanted to get things exactly between a specific two buildings or whatever, and right. exactly what time will the sun be right there, um, and right. they would do a lot of fashion work, so they right. would have the model on the street at that specific moment and be able to capture the sun coming right in from behind her. So there's a lot of things that you can do that you, you know, with these apps that you couldn't do without them, because if not, you'd be waiting around for that specific moment instead of knowing at that, that spot on the ground, um, which is really great because these apps will give you the information based on like within three feet. So it's really yeah. incredible today, you know, having that in, you know, your iPhone or on your Samsung, which is really, really quite cool. Um, let me also ask you, talking about New York, um, my understanding is that you're not really a fan of the whole um, street photography, even though you were, it's, you know, in New York for so many years, you well, still didn't write, you, mm -hmm. you wanted more of the nature. Well, it's funny because I mean I've always been a little bit of a nature nerd, even going up in the city, and uh, I wouldn't. Say, I mean, I like to look at at street photography. I'm just not something that I'm particularly drawn to doing. I think it it takes a particular, you know, type of more or maybe a more of an outgoing personality than than, than I have to walk around the streets with a camera and just you know, point it at people or point it at things, even from a distance. So from a distance is one thing, but a lot of the good street photos. Are taken from kind of you know, relatively close up, if not, you know, if not right in the face, you know, um, um, you know, just you know, just kind of close. I, I, so I mean, it's something I've thought about doing more of because right. the fact that I like to look at look at it as a genre is just not something I'm comfortable doing. It's just it's just me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, it, of course, it has to do with the size of your camera. You know, how big right. of a unit you're sticking in someone's face. Um, right. And, That's you know. Uh, can you use the images? Is there too many faces? Are the people underage in the image? There's a lot right. of things that get into right. it, and who you take pictures and I of. Think for me, for, for for me, for example, is I'm about I'm I'm I live in Palm Beach, so there's a lot of people that we take photographs off that I can't even show because of NDAs and whatnot, which is kind of a pain. Right. But so there's like, there's different things that you can do and some things you can't do. And whenever you're doing street photography, it's always that 
gray line of who you can capture, who can you not, what is their right. age, do you get a consent, do you not, are you going to use right. it, are you going to profit from it, are you just going to print it, are you going right. to put it on a wall? <laughs> so there's a lot that right. goes into it, whereas when you take one of these beautiful shots of a running stream for you know, 45 seconds, a minute, and it just looks etheric, you know, just absolutely beautiful. Um, you know, you don't have to ask the stream for consent exactly. uh, or anything. So, and once again, like I was saying, you're in nature and you can just breathe. For me, I just, I am one of those people that like nature. I'm not always out in it because I don't have enough time, but I live right. in a location that I'm on a five acre track, so I have plenty of land to be able to go do whatever I want to do and I don't have to actually leave, which is good. But um, it's still, it's one of those things, once I get into the city, it's like, well, you know, it's it's a lot. So for, for I was yeah. doing a lot in New York where, you know, I was near you at the Javits Center. Um, um, and uh, that was when PPE was really big, Photo Plus Expo. I'm sure you went there plenty right. of times, right? So I used to cover those expos uh, with Trevor Current for Digital Photography Cafe for many, many years. So, you know, being in that atmosphere is a little bit different than being down here in Florida when it comes to just that yeah. hustle Yeah, oh, totally, bustle, totally. You know? So let me, let me ask you, the YouTube channel... Um, no, I, like I was telling folks uh, earlier, I, I just found it really great. And I like the way you presented the things that you were capturing in your vlogs and whatnot. Um, when did you start that? How long have you been doing it? Well, only since last July. And I just uh, published, I think, my 20th video. So obviously, it's not, I don't have a lot of experience. And I've had to uh, teach myself a lot of stuff, just starting with teaching myself photo, uh, video editing because I'd never done it uh, before. <laughs> And I really just started, I, it, I guess I had a bug in, my, in the back of my head for a couple of years, especially when, when Heaton at that seminar I mentioned before, when he talked about uh, YouTube, even, even though it was starting to get a little saturated with landscape photographers, all of them, no, most of them British for whatever reason. But, uh, you know, but talking about that as a, as, a, mm -hmm. as, a, as a good creative outlet and a way to publicize your work. So I'd had the bug in, my, in the back of my head. And then, you know, last year I decided, especially after, you know, what happened and I had a lot more free time on my hands than I expected. I said, well, you know what? I might as well, this is as good a time to do it as any, you know? So I was able to get a new PC because I was able yeah. to, because I knew I was going to use, I was going to need more, more of a machine than the 10 year old thing I had before. So I, you know, got a new PC, kind of juiced it up pretty good and uh, really started shooting in uh, July. I shot my first ones, actually my first couple of videos mm. I shot in Maryland when I was visiting my daughter. And uh, so when you're when you're out there shooting, are you shooting with that R6, or you're you're doing the are you shooting with the 5D Mark IV? Well, well, I, I do the video I do the video with the R6, and I do my stills with the with the 5D Mark gotcha. IV. I have done a few gotcha. stills with the um, with the R6. I mean, I had one video specifically showing, you know, just showing um, or showing to myself as much as anything else um, how it was. You know, for for bird photography, for instance, and mm -hmm. I think it did pretty well. It was the first time I really wanted to, you know, see how the eye tracking worked, and and uh, which was uh, stunning, you know. And uh, the awesome. image quality is really good. Yeah, mm -hmm. and yeah, image quality is really good, even with twenty megapixels. The only thing is that there's only so much you can crop, you know. So, right. yeah, yeah. So absolutely. I had a feel, yeah. Yeah, that's, some that's, the, only, some that's the, the only things, negative with that, for that. Yeah, that's one of the things that a lot of people don't understand. I'm glad you brought up the whole crop um, when it comes to birding or any type of... So, so with landscape or anything that you can slow down and take the photograph, you really want to get it right in camera, right? So you want to frame everything exactly the way you want it, get the photo exactly how it is in camera, and then once you go and do any kind of manipulations on it, you can do the color grading and everything after the fact, but you don't want to crop right. in. Because every time you crop in, you're losing megapixels. A lot of people, they'll take right. a shot, they're like, that's beautiful, they'll crop in 50%, and now all of a sudden they've turned a 20 megapixel image into a 10 megapixel image. And they're like, why, right. is it, what, why doesn't it look good? And that's the reason. Right. So for right. the, you know, so for me, get it right in camera, which is absolutely imperative. But, and the big but here is if you're doing birding and you need to really get some long reach to it, 
full frame, even though you have some fast glass for it, it just doesn't give you that extra bit that you can on that crop. So right. cropping is almost, uh, you know, a necessity to get in there tight, but then later on you might even have to crop more to get even tighter. Right. So it just depends on what you're doing. Now, I heard that Canon has some RF glass. It's going to be, I think it's like 600, 800, 1200. It's, I think it's already out. It's been out for a while. Yeah. Which one, which one came got, out? Okay. Did well, okay. Come okay. Out well, or no. Oh, you're talking about that? The, okay. The, the, the okay, RF. No, that the, one didn't come out. That's like the, yeah, no, no. Okay. What's what they have out right now are the 600 to 800 F uh, fixed uh, uh, aperture F11s case uh, lenses, gotcha. which are both under a thousand dollars. Now the other ones you're talking about, uh, which are way, way out of my price range. I know they're going to, they're going to come out, but they're not out yet. Yeah. The two. Yeah, so they did talk they about are. 1200. Yeah. Yeah, something like a six hundred, uh, like a four hundred f two or eight, and a six hundred f four, and a eight hundred f five, and uh, right. twelve hundred. I think would also give me f five. And I, yeah, that's yeah, that's so, not that's not happening for me unless I hit the lottery. But yeah, uh, yeah, they're very expensive and they're very heavy, and a lot of that's why right. a lot of people will come back to me and say that's why I love micro four thirds because I can get in there and I can do my birding. And I'm, you know, doing 600 millimeters on a tiny lens that's very lightweight. Right. And um, that is absolutely the case. I do believe that yeah. there is definitely the right camera for every job, but there's no one camera that's perfect for every job. And that, you right. know, that holds true. But just like what you're doing here, you're doing your video with the R6, but you're doing your photo with the DSLR. So you have both, right. you know, mirrorless and DSLR, and they're good for different right. reasons. They're good. Right. That's why when I do my professional fashion work, I'm using 1Ds. Why? It's a big honking, you know, contraption, but it just works. It is a mm -hmm. beast. Um, so that's what we end up using a lot for the fashion if we need to do something quick, run and, grunt, run and gun. But right. if we're doing fashion fashion, that's going to be like magazine and work, whatnot, we're using medium format why is that is we right. absolutely need all the extra pixels our right. clients require them when it comes to post-production they want to be able to take a um, bust up shot and then be able to zoom in and get let's say a set of earrings that they're selling maybe some eyeshadow or mm -hmm. whatever with one shot instead of having to do many and with all those extra pixels with the medium format large pixels and good clean pixels, they can do that without any type of resolution loss. Um, so yeah, like I said, it just, it depends on what you're trying to do. This landscape type of work, if um, I know a lot of folks now have been moving into Fuji Films GFX line. I don't know if you've seen any yeah. of that. And uh, I, I have, yeah. One 100 of, megapixel one of the you beasts, right? <laughs> Well, the, the one that like the like the, the one that just uh, came out pretty recently, I think it's the GFS uh, GFX fifty S. No, yeah, 100, no one, the one hundred one hundred S. Yeah, 100S. no, the one hundred S. Yeah, yeah the, now that's an, that looks like an awesome camera. It's, I think it goes like for about six thousand dollars, and the lenses, of course, are very expensive too. But the image quality out of there, from what I've seen of them, you know, looks pretty awesome. Um, yeah, yeah, and absolutely. certainly for a landscaper, if, you know, who has the money for it, you know, that that certainly looks like a you know. For 100 megapixels, for the kind of uh, images that you can take, like say, one of the guys I follow on YouTube, Adam Gibbs, has the um, the earlier model of the one, the, the much bigger model of the 100 uh, GFX 100s. No, right. no, a uh, GFX 100, and his images right. are awesome. Yeah, you know? yeah. You know? But uh, I said, yeah, yeah he just, I, I understand he actually just bought that, and then of course, right after that, then the then the the 100s comes out, which is like half the size. You know, it's about the um, right. about the size of a five. Or actually so that's what always happens right whenever you yeah. you you spend the money you look back you're like ah oh, wow you know a new yeah, one just yeah. came out you know it kind of yeah it kind but that's what it is you just have to do yeah. it go for it and then just use it and then use it to the maximum and a lot of people right. really don't use their gear to the 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 maximum to the mm -hmm. most that they can get out of it and squeeze every little bit out of it because they don't have the education the proper knowledge to be able to do so so that's where i go back to you know learn your gear right. get the most that you can out of it because a lot of people don't do that and they really really exactly. should um it's a it's a big big deal too many people spend money on gear and then later on they look at their images and they're like they're almost identical to what I was shooting before, and now I just spent right. four grand. It's like, why did I do that? Right. It doesn't make sense. Right. Um, what I wanted to ask you was um, the software that you're using. 
uh, for, for editing. Um, my understanding is you use both Adobe software and non-Adobe software um, for video and for photo. It's different and whatnot. What are you currently using right. as of today? Okay. Well, as of today, well, let me go back to the beginning because once I really got into digital editing and I you know, realized you know, that I could get my, my images better by learning how to edit. And I started with Lightroom, which was at the time of, you know, it's a standalone product. Um, you know, of course, now, 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 of course, they have a different model with a subscription, which I know you've talked about at length, so I won't get into that. But I do like that product a lot. And, but then last year, again, one of the things I was doing um, during uh, once, once we had a lockdown, really, and couldn't do anywhere, was to, to learn, dedicate myself to learning Photoshop. Because there's things I wanted to do in, in terms of editing that I really couldn't do, like with luminosity masking and that kind of stuff, and more refined image cleanup. So... So I, uh, I did uh, teach myself or with an the help of an online course that I took from another photographer, Nick Page, um, awesome uh, photographer and also an awesome uh, uh, um, Photoshop master. So he has an, a set of series of online courses and right. he happened to have a sale going at the time of three different, uh, uh, um, um, course, three different courses. So I got that package and it really helped a lot. And so I finally understood how working in layers works and how luminos luminosity masking works and that kind of stuff. And it's really revolutionized how I edit. So those are the two things I use in terms of Adobe. Then once I got into, well, you know, of course I'm paying monthly for both those things, which is, I, it's not a lot, you know, but um, right. once I got into editing a uh, video, I wanted to learn how to do that. You know, I didn't want to go with Premiere Pro because that would be like another $20 a month and it started really starts to adding up. You buy the whole suite, right. you know, so. So I got it. So I, instead, I went to uh, DaVinci Resolve after checking out checking out a, few, a very, bunch of very different options, and people seem to be pretty happy with that. And so I got the free version of the Resolve, and um, you know that worked out pretty well. You know, it is you know A is free. Nice. B I yeah, found it I'd... fairly easy to learn. Now there's a few things that I found right, just recently right. and then, that you know. Does it, I'm sorry. So I said the you're only thing using, I you're found using light, you're using Lightroom and Photoshop basically, right? Just Lightroom right. and Photoshop yeah, and for, DaVinci for, for your um, video. For the video. Yeah. Right. It's a, a lot of people. Yeah. A lot of people do that because um, it's 10 bucks for the Adobe and people say, well, 120 a year, 240 every couple of years, you know, $480 for four years, whatever. We can just go ahead and do that. And then right. of course, um, after I did the life after Adobe cutting the cord thing and I took all Adobe out of the studio, I put that out there and that went over like crazy because people started getting tired of, you know, paying Adobe all the time. And, sure. uh, there was definitely other options out there, especially when it comes to Lightroom. It was, there wasn't a lot of options for a long period of time, but now the options are really good, really powerful. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to using Premiere or, you know, Final Cut or something like that, DaVinci Resolve is something that I use too, just like you do. And, right. you know, for me, DaVinci Resolve is a piece of software that um, not only is it free, which is great, but you can get the pro version, let's say, that, that unlocks some features. But also what is really nice about it is it's being used um, by a lot of color graders that are in the industry. Now I do DP work. Um, uh, you know, I've been doing DP work for many, many years, um, co consulting and on set. So I see what a lot of folks are using and they're using that software for color grading after the fact, doesn't matter if it is small episodic work or even movies. So knowing that, that, that is the case, um, it at least makes you feel comfortable using it, even the free version that, wow, there's major um, studios that are using it for doing work on a regular basis. So it's definitely powerful, powerful software. Um, one of the things that uh, we just got through, Susan asked another question. She said, if you have to choose between mirrorless or DSLR, um, how do you make that choice? Um, so you have both there. What is the what right. is the major difference for you uh, making that choice if you're going to go DSLR or mirrorless? Well, okay, that would be asking from the aspect of someone who is kind of deciding, you know, maybe doesn't have either one, is looking to looking into uh, getting getting into a camera system. In which case, I would say go with mirrorless because that's what that's the future and that's where all the innovation and development R and D is going to be. I mean, I started with um, a DSLR because that's what there was, you know. Uh, so in terms of my uh, mirrorless, yeah. uh, 
there are things in terms of since I'm staying with Canon because I've got a bunch of lenses already and you know changing systems altogether is like you know really expensive. Um, so now the Canon is putting out you right. know mirrorless products that I'm interested in, like the R6 and like the R5. You know that's that's kind of where I'm going because again that's where some of the innovation is. That's where some of the like say with the R5 they had that's going to have like you know not going to already has like 45 megapixels, which would make maybe the wildlife photography a little bit easier because then I could crop more if I have to. Um, you know, but right. the, so it's hard to say in terms of absolutely. Well, so I said so for a new shooter, I would say we go with mirrorless because that's that's where the the future R and D is going to be. That's where the, the new gear is going to be. And if you grow your photography, that's where the growth is going to be. You know, but if you have a DSLR already, then you should think before upgrading just for the you know what you got to think. Like I said before, what what do you want your camera to do that it can't do now? And if it does what you need to do now, then there's no big reason to change. If you need it. If you need to, to to change because of a specific thing that you need more speed, you need more megapixels, you need more a faster burst rate, um, you want you know better quality video or something like that. That's kind of when you want to start um, looking at what other systems are available, what other you know particular piece of equipment is available that will answer the need. So I wouldn't say DSLR right. versus mirrorless. I mean, I mean you know you even got to think about crop tested versus full frame. Um, you know, DSLR is a little bit heavier. You know, at least the bodies are heavier. But on the other hand, now you're um, you know, with the mirrorless systems. You know, you have lighter bodies but heavier lenses. So you know, where's so where's the uh, the trade off there? So you gotta yeah. Where does you know, so there's a lot of things you gotta exactly. consider. So exactly. I don't want to start. I don't want to really say either or. It depends uh, on absolutely. your particular needs and your particular circumstance. You know, what you need and what can you get that's going to answer your needs. Yeah, I think going forward, um, a lot, like you said, and I, I agree 100%, is a lot of the R&D will be going towards uh, mirrorless just because it is the future. Um, but I think that a lot of the folks out there, and I did a piece, I think it was yesterday or day before, in regards to this um, fact that DSLR is not dead even close because right. what's going to happen is a lot of people that are coming into um, photography are going to go into DSLR because it's going to be cheaper. Um, right. And then also what is really good is the, for example, you're shooting Canon. Those EF lenses, even if you buy L glass that's very expensive, those lenses are going to be able to be used on those mirrorless um, versions like an R6, right. an R5, so on and so forth. So you're not losing out by going digital or by going DSLR today if you want to go right. mirrorless tomorrow. And that is really, really an important point, I think. So if you want to go mirrorless today and you can afford that extra chunk of change, then yeah, that's fine. But it's not necessary for where we stand today unless there's something right. that it does that the other things can't do now we got from right um jose and i would add, i was i yeah, want to add ahead. one thing to that it was that yeah. the also thing is if you're starting out you don't have to necessarily buy uh, new either because right um with the, with all the new cameras that are coming out including mirrorless ones that are that are replacing you know, the dslrs you have a lot of quality dslrs that are available in the used market so you can save a lot of coin by say even with a 5d mark IV that i bought for over three thousand dollars new and it's probably like about 1200 used or something so you know you can get really good uh, uh um, bodies and lenses used as a starting point and then you know move up from there as as the need um, um uh, arises right no, absolutely. Um, Jose yeah. de Leon, he says, uh, basically, what are you using for that um, uh, luminosity masking um, mm -hmm. when, you, when you're doing those masks? He was talking about in Photoshop or however you're right. doing it. He said there's a panel right. in Photoshop. Okay, well, there's a particular, well, the plugin that I use, because there are various plugins that are available, and uh, the one that I use and the one that I actually um, got recommended by that uh, course that I've mentioned before from Nick Page is uh, Lomenzia, and it's actually pretty. It's pretty easy, it's, gotcha. you know, so, and, and it's and it's free. Yeah, right. I know there are other ones that maybe have a little bit more power, but for what I do, uh, Lomenzia is more than enough. Yeah, and that's actually what he wrote and the, in there and, too. Right, and there are a lot of tutorials, you know, from the from the from the uh, guy who makes it. I forget what his name is, uh, the guy who developed it. But anyway, it's like I said, it's a free uh, download. It works seamlessly with uh, with uh, with Photoshop, you know, and I highly recommend it. Absolutely, absolutely. A couple of people are asking about: uh, Is it possible, or it'd be great to be able to upload our shots for discussion 
Um, I, I like that. I like that idea a mm. lot. I'm going to have to figure out how we can do it. I think that we can do something like that through Discord. I'm going to have to look into it. Um, let me just let me just say that if you're not on the Discord as of yet, uh, it doesn't matter if you're watching this um, live or if you're watching it later on, the recorded version, go to community.jchristina.com. Um, when you go to community.jchristina.com, it gives you the ability to become a member of the Discord. It's free. Um, you could contribute if you want, but it's not necessary at all. There's hundreds and hundreds of photographers, videographer, tech heads, everyone there that are talking all day, every day. But there is a way, I'm almost positive, that I'll be able to bring people um, on and be able to do kind of like a show and tell. So... I'm still working on getting this whole OBS thing running 110%, but I do want to do more live in the future. I have a bunch of things set up, um, just trying to get the speeds up there, number one, and then also the back end work. I have some gear that's going to be coming, but I have a lot of thoughts when it comes to that for 2021. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what happens. I'm going to do more live stuff, but I love the idea to be able to do like reviews and talks about photos. And even like right now, when I show your photos, you're not going to be able to speak because for some reason it doesn't feel like sending your audio down the tube. <laughs> You know, which is really annoying. Oh, well. So, but it is what it is. We'll get it kind of all the kinks slowly worked out. But, you know, um, I really appreciate you being here. What I want to do is for anyone that's coming on board now, we're probably into it by 30 minutes, let's say. I want just for you to give us like that real quick, uh, you know, 30 second, whatever. Um, uh, let's call it elevator speech of who you are. So if they're coming in, they're just joining us. They know exactly who they're listening to. So go right ahead. Sure. Okay. So again, for those of you who are just joining, uh, my name is John Drummond. I'm an amateur photographer from New York City. Um, I'm 67. I've uh, been, you know, been shooting one kind or another, you know, most of my life. I've, you know, been, in, you know, I'm a trained artist, although never did it uh, professionally. But now, after having retired from my, my, my from my civil service job, I was really kind of throwing myself into uh, into uh, landscape photography uh, as a, as a particular area that I want to get better at because I had shot birds and flowers and things like that, and I'm kind of always looking for new challenges. So that's pretty much what I'm doing. And, I've, and, I, and then last year, I started a YouTube channel as another new challenge for myself to try to bring folks along on my own uh, personal journey and as well as be able to to give. You know whatever knowledge uh, that I've you know gleaned along the way to help those who are who are starting out themselves. Nice, absolutely. That's I mean that's one of the things that when I saw um, your channel, I, it just it just screamed that you're trying to help other people, and I really appreciate that. I think that's fantastic. A lot of you know there's a lot of channels that um, you know you get onto the channel instead of the person on the other side trying to help um, people. They're they're just continuously you know, um, plugging um, all kinds of products and affiliate links and all kinds of other stuff where it's like, yeah, this is the best camera for this week. Go buy it so that I can mm -hmm. make my affiliate money. Um, you know, you don't see that with some of the really good channels out there. So definitely if you guys haven't um, taken a look at John's um, channel, go check that out. In the comment area below this video, once it goes live, I'm gonna put that in there. Also, if you take a look at the description, you'll be able to see um, that information. I believe his IG is Instagram, um, Facebook. I'm not sure if it was Facebook, but I think it was Flickr. No, I have, uh, I have on there. Flickr. Yeah, Flickr, as well as your website. So you can definitely, guys, go check that out. What I'm going to do, um, you're not going to be able to speak, sorry, but I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just scroll <laughs> through some of your um, Flickr images right now because I think they're absolutely beautiful. And, um, you know, I just, I want people to be able to see some of your work. So I'm going to just kind of narrate just for literally 30 seconds of what we see here. Um, and then we can get into it. I'm sure you know exactly what it is. At the very top, of course, is the most current stuff, which is the winter shots that are absolutely beautiful. Um, and then we get into that, just the colors, the colors, this beautiful, beautiful colors, yellows and oranges and the leaves. I love the mushrooms. I mean, um, the attention to detail and finding the right shots is always a really 
for me, a hard thing because I'm like the ADD kid. So I have a hard time seeing for the forest, for the trees type of thing. So it's like, I see everything and it's like, I don't know what to shoot because there's so many beautiful things to take pictures of. Um, the bird images are beautiful. I love your use of your ND filters. Um, a lot of people don't know how to use the ND filters, let's say properly. They either overexpose, underexpose. There is a, a, a right way and a wrong way of using NDs. Um, I want you to talk about that a little bit because I know people that um, want to know about uh, photography that's more nature and landscape centric. What is it that, you know, you can kind of give to them on what NDs to use or how to use it? I know we talked about the programs that you use. Um, I think PhotoPills was one of them uh, to determine ND filtering, uh, how much, how little or whatnot. But any kind of uh, little helpful tips and, you know, what you use when you're capturing some of these images, what are you thinking? Okay, well, the, what I'm thinking of, because you know, is is basically what shutter speed do I need to get the effect that I want, and then what ND filter can do I need in order to uh, in order to effectuate the shutter speed? See, so it's really kind of starting from the end and then going backwards to well, what tool is going to get me the end result. So, say for instance, if I'm shooting, um, say waterfalls, you know, I I personally prefer. I mean, some people like shoot waterfalls like you know very long exposure, and for some and for some of the time that works, other times though, especially in order to get sort of a little detail in the water, in the flowing water, in the cascade or the waterfall, you want maybe something a little bit shorter, you know, but not like, you know, not like a 500th of a second. You probably, I, I find a sweet spot for the cascades is between a half a second to a second. So, uh, and the other thing I also use all, uh, pretty much all the time with landscapes is a, is, is a, a, a polarizing filter, or even on cloudy days, because when you when you if you're able to reduce some of the ambient reflection from the sky, that's going to bring out the co the colors more in the uh, you know in your subject, or sometimes you can turn it the other way and basically be, uh, and basically you amplify the reflection. So it's all about what effect you want and then what tool is going to get you there. So going back to the first question, the earlier question about what is my uh, most used uh, ND filter? Again, that depends on the subject. It depends on the light. Um, I just it just turns out that the six stop is probably the one I use the most, but it's you know it's not. Is not like a default. So, like I said, I would take my base exposure, then I would calculate. In fact, even my last video, I have a whole, um, a whole you know, segment of that where I took base base exposure, and then mm -hmm. it actually took me about five minutes to figure out what uh, filter I needed to use. Is did I is was it a filter that I actually have because I have a three, six, ten, and a fifteen. The fifteen I almost never use, but I have, that's just that's, that's I have that just in case I want to shoot like forever, but. Um, you know, but it say I was giving me it was giving me like an answer for like a four stop. Well, I don't have a four stop. So then, to what do I have to, what um, aperture or, or 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 ISO do I have to change to get back to the shutter speed, <clears throat> to get back, excuse me, to, bring, to get back to the right. shutter speed that I want. So that's so it's quite a bit of calculation involved. But it goes yeah, go back to know, what your what end result that you want, and then what ND filter is going to get you there. Exactly, and I mean what you're saying is I. <laughs> I've said this for a long time and it goes back to education and understanding mm -hmm. the principles behind what you're doing from your f-stop to your shutter speed to your ISO and how the three or the, the holy trinity work together. Right. And right. Once the you triangle. Exactly. And to be able to, <clears throat> once you understand it, everything becomes extremely easy. All right. It doesn't really right. matter what you're using at that point. Um, it's just, it's very, very simple. Um, and like you said, just changing ISO or changing things to be able to compensate for the difference or the not having a specific ND that you needed, it's, it's a no-brainer once you understand it. Right. And a lot of once people, you it. A, a lot of folks, you know, they want to shoot or they start out shooting in auto, right? Or P for professional, as I call it. And... Um, in so doing so, they, they don't learn what is going on. You know, what is, what's, what's the root of what's going on? And then what happens is, is then they'll finally go into aperture priority or shutter priority, and then they get themselves into a pickle where there's like backlight that's extreme, and they cannot right. compensate for it okay. using simply 
aperture priority or shutter priority. You just can't do it, right. right? So understanding everything, knowing your gear inside out allows you to create some of these amazing images, even when someone else wouldn't be able to get the shot. And that's where we get back into the photographer, you know, makes the camera or the photographer makes the gear and the gear doesn't make the photographer. It's very important right. to understand what's going on. Having that rudimentary type of understanding, the basis of everything. That's why when I do any type of teaching, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll um, give the student a camera that is, for example, like my Minolta SRT-102. It's a film camera, but it's all manual. It, you know, you get out there, you use a light meter, you figure out what's going on, and then you set it and you take the shots. You take a full roll of 24, you go back and you develop them. And people that are like new to photography, when they see those things develop, it's, it's, uh, it's awe-inspiring, you know, something that becomes into, you know, resolution, let's call it, from just a milky nature or from nothing is quite right. magical. Um, and right. I think that anyone that has just shot digital for so many years that's never shot film, I think it would be a cool thing to do, go back to the root of things and do it because it definitely gives you an understanding because there is no back screen to chimp on, right? You right. either you got right. it or you don't got it, basically it. So... As far as when it comes to, like for me, I'm sure there's a lot of people that probably want to know too, what are those challenges that you've been having when it comes to developing your own channel? You know, what type of challenges are you having to figure out? Because this I'm sure is new to you. Um, you have like 20 videos, I think you said. So um, right. what, are you, what are you working on? What makes, like what's easy and what's difficult when it comes to YouTube? Uh, well, let's see, well, Channel A, well, challenge A number one, as I you know, alluded earlier, was just learning how to edit because I had never edited before, uh, video before. So um, I had, you know, used, I installed the uh, Blackmagic, um, you know, the DaVinci Resolve, and then I had to go learn how to use it and just with the really most basic functions. Um, and unfortunately, there are a lot of tutorials both within, um, you know, within um, um, the Blackmagic website and also a lot of other users that are on YouTube that have tutorials on how to do this or how to do that. So once I got to a point where I wanted to learn how to do is get a certain effect, I was able to find videos that would teach you how to do that. And then I would go and practice, you know, practice doing it. So that's kind of how I've been going along. Um, and then most recently, right. um, I decided I wanted to learn how to, I, like say with the R6, I've been using uh, one of the standard profiles up until really recently. You know, but I want to see uh, if I get better quality uh, video in, in sh uh, shooting a log. I've been shooting, in, you know, using 4K, but with the standard profiles. So last two videos, I shot them in, lo in log. And then, of course, the first thing I found was that I had to change to the pro version of uh, DaVinci in order to get the, uh, the in order to get it to read the files. But that's another story. You know, that's apparently a fairly common uh, compatibility issue with the R5 and R6 uh, video files. But once I did that, then I had, you know, then I since I kind of made myself a fairly decent um, photo editor, I've been trying to use some, some of those same things into the um, uh, uh, color grading with the video. And with the last video, I think I'm pretty happy with the results, but I still, I still want to push myself to try to get better. So that's been yeah, my most absolutely. recent challenge is learning how to color grade. Yeah, color grading is not easy. Color grading is definitely yeah. not easy. You definitely have to have a color calibrated monitor for it to do it properly. Um, and you know, when we're, when I work on set as a, um, you know, as a director of photography, a lot of times we'll have large screen TVs that are all color calibrated to be able to look on and get the, um, grade just right in right. the camera. So then later on in post-production, obviously everything's shot log anyways, we can always color grade it after the fact, but right. we try to get things as close, um, as possible um, just shooting the show itself or um, shooting an ad spot or whatever that we're doing. It's very, very important to get things close. A lot of people think that you can go and shoot something and then later on in post-production uh, post production fix it. And it is the case and it's not the case at the same time. Some things you can't push. Once you lose certain colors or when you lose some of your darks or you lose some of your lights, um, they will never come back. The data is not there. Right. The ones and zeros right. don't exist. And that's a lot right. of people, they, they will shoot stuff and the stuff is not clear. It's not tack sharp. Right. Um, and then later on, they're like, well, you know, we'll try sharpening it in Photoshop. You can fake it, but you'll never get a sharp right. image. It's just not possible. Right. The ones and zeros are not there, right? 
Um, right. Uh, let me see. George said that he he likes uh, shooting on manual too. I mean, manual is one of those things that um, I think every photographer that wants to aspire to be pro or even a pro am, I think that it's really good to really get out there and shoot manual, especially now having the ability to chimp on the back of your camera. It's literally the most unbelievable cheat that's possible. Um, you take the shot, and now it's even better than that. Before with the DSLR, you took the shot, you look at the back. You took a shot, you look at the back, right? Now you don't right. have to do that. You look through your EVF, and now you're looking through that augmented reality. Exactly what you see is what you get. It's WYSIWYG, right? It's not like right. it used to be before. So anyways, before I go any further, I want to say that um, if you have any questions, guys, we're going to let this run for about another five minutes or so. I don't want... Uh, John to be here forever. We're trying to yeah. get these to about an hour and maybe a couple of minutes over an hour, and that's really about it. We don't want to go too much longer than that. So if you have any last minute questions, put them in the chat window. And then of course, off also after the fact, if you're not watching this live, you're watching it Memorex, so to speak, um, recorded later on in the comment area, put those questions that you have that you didn't hear answered. And both John and myself will be in the commentary to be able to answer those um, later on during the day and tomorrow. So um, I just want to kind of hand the floor over to you uh, real quick. I just wanted to get a little bit of an understanding from you as far as the landscape and nature um, photography. What is it moving forward? Where are, you, where are you going with it? What are you trying to do? Is there something that inspires you? Is there a certain person's work that is inspirational to you? Where, where are you going with it? Are you just enjoying it just the way it is now and you just kind of kind of wing it? Or is there something that you're looking to do going through 2021 with the new gear that you have well here's what i would say to that i mean first of all i've already mentioned a couple of the photographers that i that i that i follow on youtube and and whose work i admire and a couple of them whose books or calendars i bought and those being people like thomas heaton uh nick page adam gibbs uh, gavin hardcastle there's a there's a bunch of others you know and and a part of that is also wanted to just be able to get to some of the places where they've been because i think it's been said that if you want to take beautiful pictures go to beautiful places so um which you know, that ha definitely helps um so i definitely want to, once uh, things you know clean it clear up travel wise to be able to to see more of the country and more of the world and be able to really just or a i want to just see more of the country and more of the world but b be able to capture those um those those places and, and share them with others, just as um, those folks that are on YouTube or other places have been able to do that to share with me to inspire me. So that's that's kind of where it is right now. I'm, you know, I mean, I, I you know, enjoy I shooting like locally. There, um, right. Uh, Su let me just ask you real quick. Susan asked uh, one last question here. She said, "Well, how you know how do you make money off?" Um, your images, the work that you're creating. I don't. Are you looking to try to make, <laughs> there you go. So it's um, a lot yeah. of times, you know, years ago, there was a lot of photographers that made money off their images by selling rights right. to them, also printing them. Um, so for me, I make money off my images that I shoot because I do fine artwork, um, Susan. And I do all black and white, and I do use that old film camera because I like to slow down for that type of stuff because it is a piece of art. And what I do is I will print them uh, 40 by 60, very, very large, obviously, and they are not printed with like an Epson printer, let's say, blowing ink. They're actually developed um, and processed, so the images will last a lifetime pretty much. And I sell my work in galleries, so we'll have cheese and wine or whatnot, and me being the artist, I'll be in the gallery and be able to mingle with people, and that's how I'll sell a lot of my work. I did that a lot um, a couple of years back. Now, of course, we have this, uh, this uh, craziness going on for the last year, I guess. So we haven't been able to do that um, as of late, which is kind of sad because I love the one-to-one -one that I get, um, being able to show my work at a gallery and having 30, 40, 50 people around drinking um, wine and champagne, eating cheese and asking questions about why I came up with a certain shot. And I think that that's definitely a powerful thing once you are doing something that you absolutely love and you're a creative to get that feedback of what people like and what they don't like. So, you know, maybe that's something that you can do in the future. 
is maybe take some of your shots, um, print them, and maybe give them to one of your local restaurants or a local mm -hmm. uh, bookstore or something, and maybe they'll hang them um, or even show them at a gallery if you get a nice um, work, a uh, body of work put together that you can show the curator and see if they want to um, host you. So um, that's how I started. This was many, many, many years mm -hmm. ago. So it's just something to think about if it's something that you wanted to do. But it's definitely fun. You know, ultimately, that would be a great thing to be able to do. I mean, when I was a, you know, when I was a young painter before I really got into my social, uh, social, you know, social security or federal job, I did ha uh, belong to a local cooperative gallery and did have some group showings and such. And that was a lot of fun. I did, didn't sell anything, but it was a lot of fun just doing that and being part of that art community. And then all the, over the years, I got away from that. I'm now I'm back into it um, with my between my camera club and obviously, um, you know, YouTube, which has helped a lot. Um, so ultimately, yeah, I mean, I, you'll. I'm fortunate that you know I have a you know secure you know post work income, so I don't really I so I don't have to depend on my photography. If I did, I'd probably be doing things maybe a little bit more aggressively in terms of really marketing my work. Right now, I just do it because it's fun, and I find that rewarding, and I like to be able to, to right. share my images with my friends and be able to, you know, if if someone expresses interest in one and wants to buy one, that's you know that's that's gravy. Um, so my say my website right now does not have a, a print sale page. I, probably something I want to you know, get into that maybe if, of course if I don't have a print sale page on there people aren't thinking about buying prints so maybe if I do that people will look at my if they go to my site they'll they'll say oh you know maybe I want to buy this so that might something I'll need to do is uh, set up a marketplace page on my on my site you know well you know, like I said it's it's it wasn't really the end Absolutely. game for me uh to start out I mean I liked I like to create and that's really why I really got you know dope into the into the photography and the landscape photography as opposed to you know doing the commercial photography because I like to shoot for myself you know there's nothing wrong with obviously nothing wrong with working yeah, with you know doing working with the, clients and that kind of thing I did a few weddings actually on the side back in the 90s um found I hated it and I didn't do that any, do that anymore I did about four of them <laughs> but um yeah I, it's just I, it was I just wasn't for me understand that you know, a lot of work for not enough money yeah it's the art Right. Yeah. It's the art of the art. It's the art for doing art, not art to make the exactly. money. It's like once you exactly. start making money on your art, sometimes you lose a little bit of it unless you're making money um, in different locations, you know, and you don't have to right. worry about the art. The art has to remain something that's fresh and something that moves you and moves the viewer. And that does sometimes doesn't... Um, transcend a photo or any type of painting if you're doing it for money because there is a deadline there's a constraint that's put right. on you and you can't kind of like spread your wings so i want to i right. want to say that we're going to get going i want um everyone to yeah. definitely check out your youtube john's youtube um channel he's got like a, uh, about 20 videos to watch over there check him out definitely subscribe to his channel also in the comment area as well as in the description you're going to see his website as well as his instagram page and his Flickr. um so check out all of he's got a ton, thousand images i don't even know a, a lot of images for you to check out and um you know once again this is one of the jc um live member uh spotlights and i'm going to be doing a lot more of these with other members just like you john so i'm really excited about that i love what some of the folks were saying that maybe we can you know show some of folks's images here while we're talking about them um, I'm going to work out the details on that because I think it would be awesome. I really like that idea a lot. Not sure how we're going to do it as of yet, but I'll work it out. Also, what we're probably going to do is get not only more individuals like, um, like John here um, in a member spotlight, but what we're going to do is maybe bring multiple, people's, uh, multiple people online at the same time, maybe two, three people. We'll see if we can get that to work. So going forward, you're going to see a lot of that. Um, I also want to say that if you haven't downloaded my ebook yet, go check that out over at jchristina.com forward slash ebook. Once again, jchristina.com forward slash ebook, 10 tips of making tack sharp images. There is something there for everyone. So go grab that. It is free. Also, like I said before, join the community discord, the creative discord that I put together for all of us. Go to community.jchristina.com. You can find John over there now. His, uh, his tag, I believe, is John D. So say hello to him over there and definitely join. Also, if you want to contribute to the channel, 
click that little button down here below every video. It says join and you can become a member. You can contribute a dollar, two dollars, five dollars a month, whatever works out for you. And then I can give back perks um, for doing so. That is fantastic. Also, I really would appreciate all of you for doing that because we don't, as I always say, sell anything here besides the products that I make. And that is it. I do not have affiliates with who knows who or whatnot. And I'm pushing stuff that I wouldn't use myself. That will I will never do. We have some reviews coming up very soon. There is a bunch of products that have been sent over to me um, to check out that I will be seeing um, as of uh, probably about another week or two. Once I get through them, you're going to see those reviews and some of the stuff you guys have been asking me to do for a while, and I will be doing it. And finally, head over to jcristina.com, and you'll see a lot of the photography tools that I've invented over the many years. Check those out. Use promo code YT20 at checkout and you're going to get 20% off everything over at jcristina.com. So check that out. John, I want to say thank you so much for being here. I know we got a lot of questions for you. A lot of the information that you provided, I'm sure everyone um, has gleamed some type of or a tidbit or some type of tip or trick when it comes to doing landscape and with ND filters and these programs that you've um, um, told us about and whatnot that will help them out a lot. I really do appreciate you being on for certain. Well, listen, first of all, I want to thank you so much for, for, for reaching out and having me on. I mean, I really, really appreciate it. I'm certainly not something I was looking for, and I'm <laughs> glad to have the opportunity to, to, to share my work a little bit, a little more widely. And, uh, you know, and to be able to just share my experience. I and mean, if you look at my Flickr page, you can, see, you know, sorry, if you start from the bottom and you have a lot of pages and work your way up, you'll kind of see kind of where my, my path has taken me over the last, you know, seven or eight years since I've been on Flickr and where I am now. And hopefully as I, you know, keep going, I'll keep adding images and you'll be able to see uh, more growth. But it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. You know, like I said, if it wasn't fun, I probably wouldn't do it because I don't really have to. I do it because I, I shoot because I love to. And uh, hopefully that will continue. And I hope that, that YouTube goes the same way. I mean, I'm having a lot of fun doing it. You know, you know if uh, God willing, I get monetized or whatever, then that would be well, great. I, I, I can buy more lenses. <laughs> you know? But uh, you know, if not, I'll, right. I'll that, keep doing it anyway. So Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put so this just, out just here real quick. This is live. This is... I, I do appreciate you. I'm going to put this out live right here. Um, and now, right now on the Creative Discord server, we have astrophotography, macro photography, underwater photography, and all kinds of other stuff. We do not have nature landscape photography. We do not have that channel in there. I will create it. And now that John is on that um, Discord server, I will ask him if he would like to. It's completely up to him. He might moderate it. And um, if that's the case, he can share his work and ideas in there and any type of images he wants to share with you guys. And you'll be able to ask him questions um, directly when it comes to landscape. So if that's something that, that of interest to you, you don't have to say yes or no now, but it, I'm putting it out there. So once again, everyone, thank you so much. Thank you, John, for being here. We're out of here for yet another vlog. Many blessings to each and every one of you, you and your family. Thank you so much. We'll see you in the next one. Take care, guys. Thank you and see you. <laughs> Thank you, John.